So nowadays, if I, you know, make a sample in a video, I'm going to give that sample out for free, but they have to follow me on Instagram first before they can download it. Peace, what's going down? It's DJ Payne One for BeatStars.com. I'm super excited about today's interview. We're interviewing a man who needs no introduction, but he just hit 266,000 subscribers on YouTube, over 20 million video views, I believe. Um, he's also landed some pretty dope brand partnerships. You're having a, a great year, are you not? I am. Yes, I am having a good year. It's been it's been a lot of work, but it's been going good. We're, we're going to talk about the work ethic, but first of all, some background information. When did you start making beats? Oh, I started making beats like exactly 10 years ago. I think I made my first beat some somewhere like September 2009. And yeah, you know, mostly as a hobby at the beginning and then I think after high school, I started to take it a lot more seriously. I'll be honest. I was hoping you weren't going to say, you know, like oh, a year and a half ago. Anyway, uh, do you have <laughs> formal training as a musician? You play some instruments, yeah. you sing. I've been playing piano for 15 years just because, you know, my parents were just about extracurricular activities. So it'd be like Taekwondo Monday, swimming Tuesday. And then piano is just like one of those other things. So I've been doing that since I was seven. Once I got into university, I have a bachelor's degree in music composition, so I learned the majority of my theory from there. And you actually created a video, what was the title, Producers You Don't Need Music Theory? It's definitely specific to, you know, music producers. I guess uh, more pertaining to hip-hop, just because you can make everything so easy nowadays. It's never been this easy to make a beat. We can literally make one in like 10 seconds by just dragging some drums, dragging a sample loop over it. And if we can do everything so easily, then nothing is really important. So the only thing that's important is what you care about. So for me personally, it is music theory, but somebody else, it might not be that. It might be sound designing. I'm surprised at how many amazing producers who, who aren't using samples and who aren't using um, third-party loops, but who are still creating some pretty complex pieces of music, it turns out that they have no music theory background and, and couldn't even tell you the notes in, a, in like a C minor scale? Um, a lot of guys, even though they don't know, you know the technical terms of you know, music theory, they don't know the chord names, everyone, you know, a lot of experienced producers have a really good um, ear and just a kind of intuition of how chords kind of work with each other, what kind of colors work with certain colors, even though they don't know it specifically, a lot of guys have that knowledge that they've just gained over experience. So you're happy with, with your experience throughout your bachelor's degree and, and that that gave you some val valuable uh tools to uh create your production with yeah it's um i never went into university thinking i'd go into music i went for biology and i didn't realize until like a year and that i hated it so that's when i made the switch over to music so it's really valuable because it kind of helped me figure out what i wanted to do in life and look at us now. Our parents put so much into us, sent us to all these extracurricular programs, summer enrichment programs, science programs, and all that, and, and we're making beats for a living. Anyway. <laughs> so my uh, damn computer. <laughs> so uh, when did you start creating and uploading producer content? Um, I started January 2018. And um, that was kind of maybe a year after I graduated. And during that little period of time, I was trying to, you know, do more we'll say industry stuff. I was, I live in Toronto, so I go downtown, give up my resume, you know, things like that. And I just never found opportunity there. Like no one even gave me an email back. So it just seemed like I was, you know, wasting a lot of my own talent. So I thought I'd take matters into my own hands and then create a YouTube channel. Thanks. So it's only been a year and you're already at 20 million total views. That's dope. Because a lot of people look at the landscape of just the internet in general, content creation in general, the producer community in general, and they think it's too saturated for them to break in. And they've been thinking that for, for years, the last five years, and you're shaking your head now. I thought it was oversaturated as well, especially for the kind of content I'm doing, until I saw a YouTuber named Mai, and he just started blowing up while, you know, all these other figures in the, you know, space like Sharp, Aries, Pat Ryan, they were still really prominent. So. Once I saw that a new guy can still come up from that, I was like, okay, we got to do this before. Yeah, and you know, every single video on your YouTube channel has at least tens of thousands of views. Why do you think your content caught on right away? I just built a really good foundation of trust with my audience. You know, 
they have a certain level of quality that they expect from me nowadays. So I have a strong viewer, subscriber conversion rate. And then pretty much after that, just kind of trying to hit like the fun thumbnails and titles and, you know, just getting some one intrigued to click my video. So I did want to talk about that, creating subscribers from viewers. And, and, and it's not just on a single platform. I mean, you have a pretty good amount of, of followers on all of your social media platforms. How, and you said trust, you, you would say is the basis of that, but, but how else do you think you've managed to convert so many viewers who might have just watched a video or consumed a piece of content once into actual followers, subscribers, fans, customers? Uh, well, the easiest one is obviously just like a straight up call to action, just saying, hey, follow my Instagram, it's dope. And, you know, if people like you enough, that's obviously an easy way to get there. But I've got most of mine through download gates. So nowadays, if I, you know, make a sample in a video, I'm going to give that sample out for free. But they have to follow me on Instagram first before they can download it. So now there's a bit more incentive to actually do one of those things. And then you found those people end up interacting with your content because they're already interested in, in what you've created previously. Exactly. At what point did you become a full-time producer slash content creator? So when I started the YouTube January 2018, I was still working part-time at my mom's job. And I quit a few months into that job to treat the YouTube thing like a full-time job, but I still wasn't making money. I'm just super, super lucky to you know be living at home with my parents still. So I don't really have to worry about any responsibilities. I said, you know, guys, let me let me do this for a year and like go hard to see how much I can actually do. So, you know, ever since maybe July of last year, I've been treating it like a full-time job. And then I started to earn a living through it maybe a few months ago. What do you think changed a few months ago that, that allowed you to step over that boundary? Kind of increasing my streams of revenue. YouTube, like it does pay for a significant amount of my income just cause it's just growing really well, but I know that's not going to last forever. So I started, you know, going into sample loops, drum kits and stuff like that. And then you've also started influencer marketing, I guess it would be called, where I've seen you in a couple advertisements from various products, at least one. When did that start happening? Did they reach out to you? Did you just put yourself in a position to, to be contacted by these companies and, and have you discovered that more companies are contacting you after that first one? It started pretty early actually. I think I, I got my first one maybe like less than 5,000 subscribers in and that was for like a $50 sponsorship. I just have um, my email you know under my description in case I have business inquiries. So I've, everyone I've done a sponsorship with, they've just uh, contacted me first. And then if the, like, if the terms are right, then we'll do it. As simple as that. I was going to ask, so you said you quit working at your mother's job. Did you mean you were co-workers or she owns the business? No, oh, she's, uh, it's an engineering firm. So she's just one of the employees there. And I was just doing like a admin office job. I was going to say, if you were quitting at your mom's actual <laughs> business, that would have been a hell of a conversation, but you're, but they're supportive of you and they're, uh, do they subscribe to your YouTube channel? Oh yeah. They're so annoying to people about it. They, they hound other guys to subscribe to my channel. It's like. Pretty embarrassing, actually. Hey, at least your your parents know yeah. what YouTube they is. They probably got me more subscribers. I don't even need like Facebook advertisements if I have those guys around. Uh, see, there you go. And Toronto's a big city. Two people walking around the, Toronto screaming out, uh, subscribe to my son's YouTube channel could probably do a lot. <laughs> Back to what you said earlier. How do you balance your time between creating content for Instagram and YouTube and these other platforms, especially the short form content that you create that re really catches people's attention? and actually making music, which is kind of the core of who you are as a, as a music maker. There's a lot of double dipping and just kind of cross contamination, I guess, between everything. So let's say I want to make a song. I'm never just going to make a song and put it out on Spotify. It's going to be a YouTube video. It's going to be a tutorial. It's going to be me promoting my drum kit at the exact same time. So everything is kind of really merged in with each other. And uh, yeah, same thing for Instagram. If I do a video, I might just you know shorten it down to a one minute kind of clip. Send it over to Instagram. So I'm really kind of trying to optimize my workflow in that sense. So Elephant in the Room, you created a video entitled The Truth About My Beat Selling Store. Uh, and, and in it, I'm watching it and I'm holding my breath. You made the announcement that you stopped selling beats online or that you were planning on stopping selling beats online. Can you summarize that video for, for those who haven't 
maybe watch it. Um, yeah. So the um, the reason I started the YouTube channel was because I wanted to sell beats online. At the time, it's the only way I knew producers how to make money just on YouTube. I never knew about you know sample loops or drum kits like that. I just knew about beat selling. So like, okay, I'm gonna make a YouTube channel so I can get more beat sales. And then obviously. Uh, I started doing more producer heavy content, which means no rappers came to my channel. It was only producers. So having a beat selling website right now is not really a good um, use of my time just because I'm not really bringing in that kind of traffic. It's more focused to producers. So I don't really need a beat selling account. Do you at some point plan on revamping your your brand a little bit or maybe starting a separate channel or taking steps towards creating more of a revenue stream for beat licensing and beat sales? No. Um, I also started doing like my own rapping and singing now. So if I if there's a dope beat, I'm keeping it for myself. Which <laughs> means right. I'm not even like giving like my beat selling website the best content. I'm 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 really selfish with all that. <laughs> that was a really honest answer. Okay, so in watching the video I was thinking, okay, this is gonna this is gonna be one of those videos where he's deleting his his beat stars account he's doing all that and you actually didn't say that what surprised me is that you said you planned on not only keeping your your beat stars account but using it as the basis for your next uh big endeavor which is increasing your your output with regards to sample libraries and kit creations i was using all of these other e-commerce platforms that platforms that were taking a percentage of my sales and beat stars doesn't do that so when they introduced the option to sell content that you know not beats kits um pr mm -hmm. pretty much any kind of content that that you could possibly want to sell and they weren't taking a percentage off top it just made sense for me and, oh and the and the um what i like about it too was the collaboration feature where you can split yeah, so if, if you and i do a kit which we probably should uh, just putting that out there then we can we can split very easily, and a lot of e-commerce platforms don't don't allow for that. But this is this is your interview, and I'm being selfish now. Um, so what are, what are some of the features of that uh, part of BeatStars that that made you stick with them? Pretty much when I when I had the idea for just having an individual sample store, I was just in my head. I was like, I just wanted to be BeatStars, but for samples. And then I was like, Oh wait, I'm not I'm not using these BeatStars for beats anymore. Let's just let's just <laughs> revamp the whole damn window and you know the collaboration is going to be big if a lot of producers catch on for this um i think they're going to start utilizing that a lot and you know i just like how friendly just the interface is in general right now i'm still it's still really early so i'm trying to figure out how to market it properly because it feels like after you know someone makes a purchase they won't really come back unless i like update the store every so often and you know let's say Let's say I put one new sample in. Are they really going to come back to just check that one sample, or do I have to do like 20 at a time? So, um, it, yeah, it's still too early to actually say anything. But hopefully, like some other guy, you know, opens a sample store so I can just copy their marketing tactic or something because I'm not sure how to do it yet. You can create a membership program, a subscription mm -hmm. service where you're releasing beats regularly, and then that would incentivize people to come back over and over again. That's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Not with BeatStars, because you just create the membership program, and then you just upload a sample mm -hmm. however often you want, and then whoever is a member gets access to that sample. Yeah, that's a good idea, though. What is it about you that allowed you to learn all of these different uh, tasks? I mean, from, from graphic design to engineering to recording to writing music... Uh, to, to learning these new DAWs, to SEO and marketing. I mean, that's a lot of stuff to take take on, and I think a lot of aspiring producers and content creators look at somebody like you and say, I, I don't, that's too much. I don't know where to start. Every time you learn something, you should take it one at a time. You don't, if you're, you're going to burn out if you try to learn all of this at the same time. Um, the reason I learned most of this stuff is just because I was broke, so I'm not, I'm not trying to pay for somebody to do it. So I'm going to learn it myself. Uh, people who, who, for whatever reason, don't follow you right now or, or aren't familiar with where to find your content, um, what's the BeatStars website? What's the Instagram username? What's the YouTube channel? Uh, YouTube channel is Servita Music. Um, Instagram is Simon Servita Music. And my website is simonservita.com. All right. Once again, Simon Servita, appreciate your time.
much continued success. You're definitely an inspiration in the producer community, and I, and I thank you for taking the time to sit down with me. Thanks for having me.